good morning now this is the second class of our uh, topic polarization now today we will learn about amalu's law uh, so let us in the last class we have studied about what is meant by polarization then what is uh, unpolarized light what is polarized light etc so uh, when a beam of light polarized by reflection at one plane surface that is uh, briefly when a polarized light is allowed to fall on the second plane surface at polarizing angle the intensity of the twice reflected beam will vary with the angle between the plane of the two surfaces uh, now in an instrument called biot's polariscope it was found that the intensity of this twice reflected beam is maximum when the two planes are parallel and zero when the two planes are at right angles to each other a similar experiment uh, we have demonstrated in our uh, last class so uh, now the same is true for the twice transmitted beam also from the polarized analyzer so in here what you need to study is only the statement that is state malus law so uh, you just uh, study this statement that is enough what is malus law so the law of malus states that intensity of polarized light transmitted through the analyzer varies as the square of the cosine of angle between plane of transmission of analyzer and plane of polarizer that is the statement so study that statement well malus law okay now proof is given here here a polarized vibration is resolved into two rectangular components that is one is the parallel component and the other is a perpendicular component to the plane of transmission of analyzer so from this figure oa is uh, represented by the letter a which is nothing but the amplitude of vibrations transmitted or reflected by the polarizer now what is theta it is the angle between the plane of transmission of polarizer and analyzer now we resolve this op into two components one is along oa uh, that component is actually a cos theta and the other is along ob which is actually a sin theta now the component along oa is the only component that it is transmitted through the analyzer so what will be the intensity of transmitted light through the analyzer it will be i is equal to a cos theta whole square that is again equal to i is equal to i zero cos square theta here i zero is nothing but a square which is actually the intensity of the incident unpolarized light now what happens if theta is equal to zero i will be equal to i zero and what will be uh, i if theta equal to 90 that is if the two planes are perpendicular i will be zero that is what we established earlier that is when the plane of transmission of polarized and analyzer are parallel intensity uh, of the transmitted light through the analyzer i that is i will be maximum that is i zero now if the um, angle between the plane of transmission of polarizer and analyzer is 90 that is if they are perpendicular to each other intensity of the transmitted light will be zero okay so in here you need to study only this statement as well as this proof okay that is uh, here malo malus uh, states that as per this equation we can define it is the uh, uh, see compare with this uh, sentence that is intensity of polarized light transmitted through the analyzer varies as square of the cosine of the angle between plane of transmission of analyzer and plane of polarizer okay so study the statement and the proof now what is double refraction another phenomena it is also called by the name by refringence uh, it is an optical property in which a ray of light entering a medium is decomposed into two rays that is each traveling in different directions okay that particular phenomena is referred to as double refraction or birefringence 
and those two rays are named as ordinary ray that is o ray and uh, extraordinary ray or e ray okay so we already said that uh, it will be decomposed into two rays that one of the rays will travel with the same velocity in every direction we call it as ordinary ray whereas the other ray travel with a velocity uh, depending upon the propagation direction and that ray is the extraordinary ray okay so but double refraction the definition is very important so study that also you will be asked define double refraction or define by refrigence that is the most probable question next definition is optic axis here uh, they have shown you the diagram of a calcite crystal and here uh, its opposite corners are represented as A and C1 then uh, all the angles are obtuse now the corners that is A and C1 in this figure are known as blunt corners okay now a line drawn through A1 making equal angles with each of the three edges will give the direction of optic axis okay any line parallel to this line is known as optic axis so define optic axis if the if they ask a question like that you have to write optic axis is not a line it is only a direction uh, when the three edges of a crystal are equal line joining the blunt corners will coincide with the crystallographic axis and that will give you the direction of optic axis now this phenomenon of double refraction which we have already discussed will not take place that is it will be absent when the light enters into the crystal along optic axis so here you need to study uh, from here that is this one up to this okay that is enough what is optic axis and what are the peculiarities of optic axis so that is enough then here uh, they are demonstrating the phenomenon of double refraction with an exam with an experiment here they have taken a piece of paper and they have made a mark uh, that is with an ink dot then a calcite crystal is placed over the dot now while looking through the crystal two images are observed one of the image rotate uh, okay one uh, two images are observed now uh, you are asked to rotate the crystal slowly and place your eyes vertically above the crystal so when you do this it is found that one image remains stationary that is it will not move whereas the second image rotates with the rotation of the crystal so that stationary image is known as ordinary image and the one which rotates along with the rotation of the crystal is the extraordinary image now this is the corresponding figure showing the phenomenon of double refraction now in the figure uh, the ray AAB that is the incident ray is split into two rays that is uh, the ordinary ray that is BO and the extraordinary ray BE now here uh, in this paragraph they are discussing about the difference between ordinary ray and extraordinary ray first difference is that ordinary ray obeys uh, laws of refraction whereas extraordinary uh, ray does not obey the laws of refraction now Uh, uh, then uh, next one is the light in ordinary ray is polarized at right angles to the light in extraordinary ray then uh, next one is a uh, refractive index of ordinary ray is a constant in all direction whereas refractive index of extraordinary ray varies according to direction then so these are the three differences between ordinary ray and extraordinary ray here uh, uh, the refractive index uh, are expressed in terms of birefringence uh, that is uh, how it is expressed that is it is expressed as a measure of difference in refractive index that is birefringence can also be expressed in terms of the difference in refractive index that is uh, birefringence b is equal to refractive index high minus refractive index low that is mu high is the largest and mu low is the smallest refractive index 
okay that is uh, the expression for birefringence in terms of refractive index now here is a note a ray of light will not split into ordinary ray and extraordinary ray if it is incident on the optic axis that we have already seen that is the phenomenon of double refraction or birefringence means the splitting up of uh, the incident ray into two that is ordinary ray and extraordinary ray but that phenomena or that phenomenon of birefringence will not take place if the incident ray falls on the optic axis okay uh, so if it is uh, if it, uh, that is if the light is incident on the optic axis the phenomenon of birefringence will not take place that means both ordinary ray and extraordinary ray will travel along same direction with same velocity now what happens if the instant uh, light uh, uh, falls on the optic axis in a direction perpendicular to it then uh, the ray of light is not split up into ordinary ray and extraordinary ray it means ordinary and extraordinary ray travel in same direction but with different velocity in the above case it was it travel along in same direction with same velocity but in the second case it is traveling in same direction but with different velocities okay now hygen explained this double refraction in uniaxial crystals as follows that is he explained it with the principle of secondary valence that is a point source of light in double refracting medium is at the origin of two wave fronts now for ordinary ray we already said that velocity of light is same in all directions so its wave front will be spherical whereas in the case of extraordinary ray we have already said that velocity varies depending upon the direction of propagation so wave front is not spherical instead it will be an ellipsoid of revolution so that is another difference between ordinary ray and extraordinary ray for ordinary ray a wave front is spherical why because its velocity is the same in all directions whereas for extraordinary ray wave front will have the shape of an ellipsoid of revolution why because velocity varies depending upon the direction of propagation now the velocities of ordinary ray and extraordinary ray are same along the optic axis this is how uh, the optic axis is given in the case of a calcite crystal and quartz crystal here uh, the figure a shows that of a calcite crystal here the sphere is a wave surface for ordinary ray and the ellipsoid is a wave surface of extraordinary ray right then uh, the ordinary wave surface lies within the extraordinary wave surface that is sphere lies within the ellipsoid of revolution in the case of calcite crystal uh, so such crystals are called negative crystals now in the case of positive crystals like quartz here uh, how is it here uh, extraordinary wave surface lies within ordinary wave surface that is ellipsoid of revolution is lying inside the spherical wave front that is in negative crystal like calcite spherical wave front uh, of ordinary ray is lying within ellipsoid of revolution of uh, extraordinary ray whereas in positive crystal like quartz uh, the spherical wave front of uh, uh, the uh, that is the ellipsoid of revolution of extraordinary ray is lying within the spherical wave front of ordinary ray now for negative crystals that is for calcite uh, this mu zero is greater than mu e that is refractive index of ordinary ray is greater than refractive index of extraordinary ray uh, the velocity of extraordinary ray varies as the radius vector of ellipsoid okay it is least and equal to velocity of ordinary ray along optic axis but it is maximum at right angles to the direction of optic axis now uh, what about positive crystals just the opposite that is refract index of extraordinary ray is greater than the refract index of ordinary ray velocity of extraordinary ray is least in a direction at right angles to the optic axis it is maximum and is equal to velocity of ordinary ray along the optic axis so we can conclude that from hygen's theory wave fronts in uniaxial crystals are a sphere and ellipsoid 
and there are two points where these two wave fronts touch each other you can see those two points here and the line joining those two points will give you the direction of optic axis now the last session is about uh, the principal refractive index for extraordinary ray uh, it is uh, defined as ratio of sine of angle of incidence to the sine of angle of refraction when the refracted ray travels perpendicular to the direction of optic axis that is the definition now refractive index of extraordinary ray is equal to velocity of light in vacuum by velocity of extraordinary ray in a direction perpendicular to the optic axis for positive crystal velocity of extraordinary ray traveling perpendicular to the direction of optic axis is minimum and refractive index is maximum okay thank you